We know the climate is changing and it will continue to change, but how much it changes very much depends on what we do, especially in the next decade. One out of every two breaths of oxygen is coming from oceanic plankton. The ocean is our very best carbon sink, and we need to figure out a way to stop having the ocean carry such a load for us. We have to think beyond trying to protect and save Mother Nature, but use us as farmers to breathe life back into the ecosystem. Making sure people understand there's a different way is critical. this point in human history where we all need to look at what skills we have and what we're good at and how we can use those to be a part of the solutions that we know are needed. I want it to be safe. I want it to be healthy. I want it to be restoring nature instead of destroying it. This is the way that I want my food to be. This isn't really about the environment for someone like me. If we don't protect ecosystems, there are no jobs, there is no food on a dead planet. I don't want to just fish for a while, I want to die in my boat one day. I was born and raised in Canada, in Newfoundland, in a small fishing village. We measured fish, its freshness, within hours, not days. I dropped out of high school when I was 14 and headed out to sea. I was working at the height of industrialized fishing, tearing up entire ecosystems, chasing fewer and fewer fish further and further out to sea. And then the cod stocks crashed back home in Newfoundland. 30,000 people were thrown out of work overnight. And that's when I realized that as a fisherman, my job was then to figure out a way how to work with the ocean, ask the ocean what our relationship should be to it. I went on that journey and I started out on the salmon farms. And unfortunately, aquaculture made all the mistakes of land-based industrial agriculture. A monoculture using pesticides, fertilizers, fish escapes, all the things you think of. So I left that and then kept searching and ended up in Long Island Sound as a oysterman and had to shift into this sort of whole new identity as a, as a farmer. And then the storms hit. Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Sandy came in, destroyed my entire farm. So here I was once again in a situation where the ecosystem was destroying my small business, destroying my livelihood. Sort of a canary in the coal mine for a climate crisis that's come a hundred years earlier than expected. For me, I look back and that moment of crisis and failure was probably the most important moment of my life. Back against the wall, choosing whether I head back to land or do I go and figure out how to build a climate resilient farm out there. And I think that's kind of where we are as a society. Right? Our backs are against the wall. We can either give up, flee, and just let this planet die slowly, or we can innovate. And then it becomes kind of an exciting journey. So I'm an ocean farmer. No, oh, wait. Um, I'm a regenerative ocean farmer. Imagine an underwater garden where we grow a mix of shellfish and seaweeds. And it's a pretty simple system. You have anchors down the bottom going up the surface and then horizontal lines down below. And from there we grow our kelp vertically uh, downwards next to mussels, we have scallops and lantern nets, and then oysters in cages and clams down below. The fact that our farms are vertical means that we can grow incredible amounts of food in small areas. So per acre, I could grow 10 tons of seaweed and 250,000 pieces of shellfish. If you were to build farms in less than 5% of U.S. waters, you'd sequester as much carbon as output as 20 million cars, create 50 million jobs, and the protein equivalent of 3 trillion hamburgers. Mother Nature abhors monoculture. She does not run single creature systems, right? She has all these different organisms working together in symbiosis. So as an ocean farmer, my job is to replicate that and use my kelp and shellfish to work together and build a system that's vibrant 
It's also important to me as a small business person because I've got different species I can harvest year round, which diversifies the risk and especially the era of climate change. Storm comes through, wipes me out one season, well, I've got another crop that I can be harvesting the following season. And that creates community and economic resilience. So we think of polyculture all of from an environmental point of view. No, it's also essential from an economic point of view. We asked the ocean, what does it make sense to grow? And it turns out, it's pretty simple. Don't grow things that swim away or that you have to feed. And as soon as you change that mindset of not growing salmon, tunas, things like that, it opens up this whole world of regenerative ocean agriculture. Well, the ocean has an enormous capacity to produce food. And what we've done to date is really focus on catching wild fish. But somehow we still expect these massive, magnificent tunas to be sustainable at scale. And that's just totally absurd because if tunas lived on land, they'd be like the dragon that eats a lion. They're so high up on a food chain, there just isn't something equivalent to that on land. And so we have to think about moving from catching wild animals in the ocean to farming. But if we farm animals, again, we wouldn't be farming lions if we were farming animals on land. And so when we want to think regeneratively, restoratively in the ocean, it's really important to think about where we're farming on the food chain. And the lower on the food chain, the better, the more efficient it can be in terms of producing food. The kelps and the shellfish, they require zero inputs. So that means no water, no fertilizer, no feed, and no use of land. And this makes it hands down the most sustainable form of food production on the planet. Our role isn't to catch or cage fish. Our role is to create ecosystems for fish. So, you know, our kelp, our oysters, mussels all work together and create this whole world that fish can come hide, thrive, and eat. And in fact, some of the best fishing in the entire area is on my farm, because we've rebuilt this ecosystem. We have to think beyond trying to protect and save Mother Nature, but use us as farmers to breathe life back into the ecosystem. Everything that we do ends up in the ocean and then comes back at us. We like to think of America as this bountiful land of diverse crops. But when we look at the heartland of the United States, we're really talking about just a handful of what are called row crops, corn, soy, wheat, and some other grains to some extent. Those crops are super fertilizer intensive, particularly corn. That corn isn't really coming to our plates directly. Mostly the corn and also the soy crop is being used to feed cows, pigs, chickens. So we're already losing energy by feeding this stuff to animals that we're then eating. And then when you consider on top of that, that a huge amount of these animals are being fed this corn in confined animal feeding operations or CAFOs, which also produce this huge amount of runoff in the form of feces that gets into waterways. That it's like this double whammy that's extremely inefficient in delivering quality nutrients to our plates. It's so efficient to grow oysters and mussels and clams that it actually has a lower carbon footprint than being vegan as a source of protein. Beef is around 28 kilograms of CO2 for a kilogram of beef. Mussels can be 0.6 kilograms of carbon dioxide for every kilogram of muscle meat produced, which is incredible. When I think about the role of the ocean in our global ecosystem, I think right now a lot about its ability to be part of a climate solution. Kelp soaks up five times more carbon than land-based plants. These incredible forests, sequoias of the sea. You take oysters, they filter 50 gallons of water a day, taking the nitrogen out of the water column. And of course, too much nitrogen in our oceans is the cause of ocean dead zones. A dead zone is when you have excess fertilizer on land that comes into the ocean that has this population explosion of algae, and then that dies, decomposes, uses up all the oxygen, and then it suffocates marine life. So this is a problem for ecosystem from bottom to top. 
The work around kelp farming is really interesting from a number of different perspectives. On the one hand, it is definitely pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, storing it in the actual tissues of kelp that we then eat. In the case of what Brandon Smith is doing, it removes excess nitrogen. And, and that's really the game changer as far as trying to eliminate dead zones and so forth. And if we can get commercial forces doing that as part of their business plan, it's a win-win situation. Regenerative ocean farms are important for three reasons, I think. One is they're regenerative, so you have carbon, nitrogen, things like that. Second way is they're replicable. Right? So if you take 20 acres of boat and a lease, anybody can start their farm with 20,000 bucks. Right? That means that we're able to replicate fast. Think of it almost as the nail salon model of the sea, which requires minimal capital costs, minimal skill requirements, and that allows us to scale. About five years ago, we created Greenway, which is a nonprofit to train the new generation of ocean farmers. So it's not just sort of grumpy old fishermen like me, but we're bringing people from all walks of life into this industry. In the climate era, scale is essential. We can't do this small as beautiful anymore, right? We've got only got a couple dozen years and we have to move on this fast. We can have farms dotting our coastlines, and I think of them as Greenway reefs. You have 50 small-scale farms, a processing hub, a hatchery, rings of institutional buyers and entrepreneurs, and then you recreate those reefs up and down the coast. I talk to farmers and they all say there's a nutrient crisis on land, right? Whether it's the micro or macro nutrients, they've all been leached from the soil by corporate ag. Well, it turns out they're in the ocean. Whether it's carbon, whether it's nitrogen, whether it's all these micronutrients, I have those. So this is an incredible opportunity to build a bridge between land and sea. Right, and close that nutrient loops. I can use my shellfish and seaweeds to collect those nutrients and then we can bring them to land and the farmers can use them as fertilizer, which by the way has been done for hundreds of years. This is about a revival of traditions in an appropriate way for this climate era. But there are other possibilities too. So if you feed cattle a 2% diet of a type of seaweed, you get a 58% reduction in methane output. This stunning think, right? So again, let's leverage the sea to address some of the biggest challenges on land. And it keeps going, let's blend these whole systems. I think one of the reasons we're excited about this space is it allows us to do food right. Like the oceans are kind of a blank slate. So we can build a food system, an agricultural system from the bottom up and do it the right way. We can make sure we're doing polyculture, not monoculture. We can make sure we don't privatize our seeds. We can make sure that beginning and new and under-resourced families can begin farms so we have a social justice element. And that's what's exciting. We can build this whole new economy out there. We're moving beyond this politics of no, but what's our politics of yes? Too often our thinking stops at the water's edge. Let's create that circular economy, that circular nutrient loop, and circular food system.